Sometimes I lie awake at night and remember how when I was 13 I watched High School Musical some 800 times and now, 16 years later, a tiny inconsistency still bothers me. So... <sighs> context. Troy Bolton is a popular basketball player who wants to sing in the school musical play. But he can't because jocks shouldn't sing or something. Finally, his unsupportive friends decide to support him and we get this sweet moment. I mean, win or lose, we're teammates. Okay, that's what we're about. Even if you turn out to be the worst singer in the world. Which, you know, we don't know because we haven't actually heard you sing. Wait a moment, you are wrong, Jason. I mean random character whose name I definitely don't know. You guys have all heard him sing. In the Emmy nominated, I kid you not, look at all those awards. Number, get your head in the game. Troy sings about the need of retaining his uppermost anatomical unit within the confines of the basketball playing act in a connotative sense. And all fellow team members including but not limited to Jason, Chad and Zeke, stop! Stop knowing their names! Are right there singing and dancing with him. So they did hear him sing, or did they? Here's the thing about musicals they're weird. Prince Ali has a not just because people advance the story or manifest their thoughts and feelings in song numbers with possible accompanying choreography. You got the steps. You got the notes. But where's the sass, baby? But because there is an unwritten rule that somehow this set piece is not actually taking place in the movie's world. And here's what numbs my mind. Why not? We know that those are actors pretending to be someone else. We know those are carefully constructed sets. We know that everything before our eyes is fake. So why do we find it odd when characters resort to song and dance? Why do we presume that instead of musical numbers happening sporadically or always in this make-believe world, they are the fruits of characters' imaginations in some kind of cutesy schizophrenic delusion? I realize that there's a practical world and a dream world. I know which is which. I shan't mix them. Because no matter what we are watching, we want to believe that it takes place in our world, the real world. And I have no idea why we have that need. Gone is that dream. Let's talk about diegesis. Diegetic is the sound that happens inside the world of the movie. A song the character is listening, for example. Non-diegetic sound is that which we, the audience, hear, but the characters don't such as a climatic score. <laughs> Musical numbers present themselves as diegetic. The characters are right there singing, there's no question about it. Yet, we instinctively rationalize them as non-diegetic, as mere spectacles for us, the audience, that don't affect the plausibility of the supposedly real world we are watching. Don't get confused yet, we are just getting started. Five, six, seven, eight. In Chicago, director Rob Marshall went out of his way to make every song that isn't performed on a stage happen inside Roxy Hart's imagination. You are such a great audience! And... I just, I really feel like I can, I can talk to you, you know? She hears a story, she sees an event, and she visualizes it in the form of song and dance. So what do you think? Come on, you can say. Things make sense then. Every number is just the protagonist's vivid mind interpreting the world in her own way. Shut up, Tommy. Mr. Billy Flynn in the press conference rag. Notice how his mouth never moves. Few musicals give us an explanation so clearly though, and... 
because of this strange mix of diegetic and non-diegetic, of fantasy and reality, all sorts of strange questions arise. In Singing in the Rain, the characters are making a musical and they feel compelled to find an explanation to why the characters in their film sing and dance. The hero's a young hoofer in a Broadway show, right? Right. Now he sings and he dances, right? Right. For one night backstage, he's reading the tale of two cities, in between numbers, see? And a sandbag falls and hits him on the head, and he dreams he's back during the French Revolution, right? Right. Now, why do the characters in Singing in the Rain sing and dance? <laughs> Things reach brain not levels once you realize the songs that they are singing exist in their world. Now sing. Huh? I said sing. Good morning, good morning. Don, keep your eyes riveted on my face. All night through, good morning. Good morning. Did those three weirdos just up and decide to sing the famous tune Good Morning out of the blue at the same time? Good morning. Good morning to you. What are you going to sing, Miss Lamont? Singing in the rain. Singing in the rain. So is he actually singing, singing in the rain, in the rain? That cop treats him like a crazy person who is. Anyway, why do we care? The Wizard of Oz has some kind of explanation for its songs. Characters only sing in Oz, the amazing technicolor world of dreams and magic. You have to see the wizard, the wonderful wizard of Oz. There is a single song in the movie's real world. Over the Rainbow, which is about Dorothy's dream of living her depressing life and going to a beautiful land of fantasy. Songs become a symbol of escapism then, so they make sense. Or they seem to make sense until you imagine Dorothy spending her time in her Kansas farm writing and composing a hit song on her own before singing alone to the sound of a full orchestra. Dorothy! My sawed off Sondheim. So, just like everything that happens in Oz, is that song a figment of her imagination? And why do we care? Here in Mamma Mia, these guys are casually singing the previous song. So that number did happen. Does ABBA exist in this world? And why do we care? The most common question musicals raise is just what is going on while the characters are imagining those songs, presuming they are imaginary. Emma Stone isn't really singing during that audition in La La Land with supernatural control over the lights, is she? That woman is a musical mutant, hire her before she kills us. Think of the greatest showman. One of the rare musicals in which all the songs are great. You know what, I love this movie and I don't give a f Circus owner P.T. Barnum travels to Europe to hire soprano singer Jenny Lynn, and we have an extraordinary, completely diegetic scene of her singing in the movie. Strangely enough, though, hiring her was mostly unnecessary. Personally, I myself would journey to the depths of the earth to get Rebecca Ferguson, but from a monetary standpoint, what about Barnum's Freaks? He already has an entire circus worth of Broadway-level singers. Every time we see his employees in action, they are singing and dancing. But these numbers are nothing but dramatizations. Look at the audience clapping and cheering. Is even the ecstatic applause imaginary? Are we supposed to believe they do nothing besides standing awkwardly around? Oh, what a circus! Oh, what a show! When he meets the bearded lady, she is singing and he compliments her voice. Sir, I have to ask you to leave. You are so talented, blessed, 
What was that about? By the way, here's another question. Why doesn't the bearded lady shave? She is presented as a sad pariah hiding in the shadows ashamed of her appearance. Look at Barnum and Troy Bolton's baby faces. Every man shaves, why wouldn't a woman? Moving on. Out of all the mysteries musicals illicit, my favorite has got to be the one you get once you start thinking about musical montages. When a song is used to shorten a long period of time. Let's get down to business. A character starts singing one day. Okay. Then, sometime in the future, the song continues. And sometime further in the future again. I have several questions. Did the singer stop the song mid-thought? Is he now randomly singing unannounced? Imagine you're talking to a friend and he just spurts out the middle of a song he left unfinished five days ago. Damn, there's that crazy singing girl again. This A Million Dreams song from The Greatest Showman took some 30 years to be finished. Yes, 30. There's no way you'll ever convince me that Hugh Jackman is in his 20s. That's more implausible than any musical number rationalizing I can come up with. And what about this casual suicide attempt by his wife? It might also be possible the character sang the whole song through every time, but we only got parts of it. Then, is he singing it in its entirety every single time just so we can get perfectly edited glimpses that make up a single performance? When we don't see his mouth moving, does it mean he is humming under his breath and imagining a full orchestral piece? I feel pretty, oh so pretty. I feel pretty and witty and get Here Mulan is just moping around when Shang goes full You're a Zulekord, the rise of war, so back up, go home, you're true Then he leaves and he's still singing Look at how far away he is and we hear him like he's right here Shang, let your soldiers sleep You know this is the song John Wayne, Gary Cooper and Clark Gable listen to every day before going to bed and after waking up, right? Mr. I After all these questions concerning musical montages, the most important is, of course, why do we care? It's that useless necessity to think that whatever we are watching is supposed to be believable in the real world. But works of art and entertainment shouldn't be slaves to plausibility. Sometimes a cigar is just a cigar. Sometimes a musical number is just a musical number. Why can't Grease Lightning take flight and go fight a Star War? There's no need to relate it to real life, but mankind can't stop doing it and drama got somehow elected as the noble movie genre, while anything that escapes in any way from realism like sci-fi, fantasy and horror gets leftover treatment. It's no wonder the Golden Globes and other awards split their categories into respectable drama and riffraff comedy or musical. As if West Side Story and Sweeney Todd were as serious as The Hangover. It's a shame that this disrespect ended up happening to musicals, the heirs of the opera, which in its zenith was called the amalgam and high point of all the arts. Escapism should be prized and not shunned. No movie genre is as inventive, ambitious, grandiose, creative and emotional as the musical. Glorious Technicolor, breathtaking cinemascope, stereophonic sound. But you know, the world can see them in a way that's different than who they are. This obsession with realism is an anchor holding down this most alive of genres. Such movies should be soaring, flying. Run. Wait, did I? Never mind. <laughs> <laughs>
we must stop trying to find real-life logic behind musicals. Because they are like a wave the ocean just can't control, connected by a feeling in our... Am I quoting High School Musical? So, musicals, musicals, musicals... There's not a star in heaven that they can't reach... Ah, fuck it. What can I do? That's good shit. Thank you for watching. If you enjoyed this video, please like, subscribe and share it. And what is your opinion on musicals? Which one is your favorite? Is there another genre you'd like to hear me talk about? Leave a comment. I will see you next time and this is Movie Wise.